Hi there, and you're very welcome to Doc Connecting with David Icke. Last time we talked about the, the spider in the center of the web and how the web um, represents in its symbolic strands secret societies, semi-secret groups, and then out in the scene arena, governments, government departments, intelligence agencies, banks, corporations, biotech cartels, and all the rest of it. Um, and what I want to talk about this week uh, is what the spider is. What is this spider in the shadows, deep in the shadows, from which the agenda for the world is played out, and then out uh, in the, on the edges of the web in the form of politicians and, and bureaucrats and corporate heads and all that stuff, the, 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 um, the agenda gets played out in changes in legislation uh, and the direction that society goes. And so in this, uh, in this program, we're going to get into some areas that you'll rarely see even conspiracy researchers talking about. In fact, one of the things that I have done in the last um, quarter of a century is unite the whole mainstream media and much of the alternative media, as it's called, in con condemnation and this is ridiculous. You know, that guy's crazy. Um, and I just want to put the dots together to take the agenda that we see unfold in the news, on the television, in politics, the Orwellian agenda, the, the crushing of people financially, the constant centralization of power that I talked about last time. Where is it coming from ultimately? And another question, um, this hasn't been going for five years or 50 years or 100 years. You know, it, most um, people that have researched this take it back hundreds of years and, and thousands of years, and in my case, many, many eons beyond that. And then the question comes, when people are being born and playing a part in this conspiracy of taking the world into this Orwellian nightmare by the constant centralization of power and manipulation of politics, manipulation of money and banking, all that stuff, and then they die. And then someone else is born here, and they do the same. And all these people, through what we call history, have been doing this, and yet they knew that they were going to be gone before any of it transpired. So many people have asked me over the years, what is this common theme that spans what we call time that has held this, this agenda, this conspiracy together, um, through generation after generation after generation, there has to be something which is beyond the human perception of time, some common theme. And to really appreciate what it is, you have to study the nature of reality as it really is. And so if you research the conspiracy, in the five sense world that we can see and we, we perceive every day, alone, without understanding the nature of reality and the fact the world isn't as, as solid like it seems to be, then you'll never understand that. And I'll explain why. I'm uh, looking now at this studio and uh, I appear to be seeing everything there is to see in the space that I'm looking at. But I'm not. I can't. All I'm able to decode in the space that I'm perceiving is a tiny, tiny band of frequency called visible light. Now, mainstream science uh, says um, that of the mass matter energy that exists in this universe, the electromagnetic spectrum is about 0.005% of what we can perceive. Some say it's, it's a bit higher, but not much. Visible light, the only frequency band that, of, of uh, reality that we can perceive as something we see, is a fraction of the 0.005%. So humans, in terms of seeing what is in the space they think they're looking at, are basically blind. 
however, as I've said many times, if you can manipulate through science and media and what we call education, you can manipulate and squeeze the public, the target population, as I would put it, the target population's perception of the possible, then you can do what you like and things can be happening outside of that perception of the possible, which people will just dismiss by reflex action. So people go, oh, David Icke is talking about reptiles, he's mad and all that stuff and that's it. Is that it? That's as far as it goes because from this perception what I'm saying can't happen. They can't be what we call shape-shifting people where they change shape. How can, how can it be? Impossible. But when you um, expand uh, your understanding of reality and the nature of reality, these things become straightforward. So absolute foundation of the manipulation of human perception, i.e. from that manipulation of human society, is to hold people in a narrow band of perception of the possible. We think that this world is solid. It can't be. Because they tell us that uh, the world and solidity is made of atoms. Well, atoms have no solidity. They're just pockets of energy. The quantum physics has shown this. And thus, um, something that has no solidity cannot create a solid world. What we are living in, in effect, is a very advanced version of the wireless internet. The wireless internet is probably in this building. Um, where is it? Where is it? I can't see it. But you get a computer and you um, tune it into the internet and suddenly you have a whole global reality called the World Wide Web accessible on the screen. So suddenly out of the unseen has come the scene because it's decoded uh, the unseen information onto a screen that we can see within this band of frequency we call um, visible light. And if you um, are in South Africa or Australia or America or Britain, when you tune your computer to the internet, you are tuning it to the same collective reality. Apart from places like China, where great chunks of the internet are firewalled off to stop us uh, or stop the Chinese people accessing information the authorities don't want them to see, you can access the same collective reality. So, the human body is what I call a biological computer. And what it's doing is decoding um, from this collective information field information which is then turned into a reality that we think we're seeing and we think is solid, but isn't. So when you look at how the five senses work, and the, the ear is the classic example, but they all work like this, it takes vibrational information it turns it into electrical information which it communicates to the brain and the brain then decodes that into holographic information, illusory physical, like a holographic movie that you see these days, these 3D movies, um, um, and turns it into a reality we think we're experiencing. Every second, this is mainstream science, we are taking um, in what they call impressions of realities, like still pictures if you like, impressions, 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 and, 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 and the, the brain is taking that information and turning it into a reality. Of that 10,000 impressions that we receive every second, the brain takes just 40-ish to construct our reality. So. In effect, you've got a mass of information coming at you or around you and you're just taking a fraction of it and thinking it's everything. And what the body does, because our true self is consciousness, awareness, 
uh, infinite awareness. It's that awareness which, when people have near-death experiences or out-of-body experiences, when they're experiencing reality beyond the body, they're still in awareness, actually in a more expanded awareness when they're outside the body. That's who we really are, awareness. That's the infinite self. But when we choose to come into this reality and experience what there is to experience, um, we take on an outer shell so that we can interact with this frequency band of visible light because our consciousness, the true self, our, our awareness, um, is vibrating so quickly and so differently to this reality that we, we want to experience that it couldn't pick those glasses up. It's like Radio 1 trying to pick up Radio 2. It, they're on a different frequency. They, they can't interact. So the body is a vehicle, a holographic vehicle, to allow our awareness to interact with this reality so we can um, have what we call a human life. Um, and the illusion of physicality can be explained uh, in a, um, or symbolized very powerfully in a, in a story I read in a book by a man called Michael Tolbert. He wrote a brilliant book back in the early 90s called The Holographic Universe. And he told um, a story uh, in the book about uh, how he, his father had a party and had a stage hypnotist coming along to do party tricks. And what uh, happened at one point is he got a guy, I think his name was Tom, and he sat him down and he was taking him through the, you know, the party tricks. You know, he's, he's eating an apple, he thinks it's a potato and all that stuff, or vice versa or whatever. And at one point, when he's coming towards the end, he said, Tom, when I bring you back to a waking state, you're not going to be able to see your daughter in the room. At which point, the hypnotist led the daughter to stand in front of Tom. So the father is looking in the belly of the daughter. He brings him back to a waking state, apparently. And he said, Tom, uh, can you see your daughter? He's looking around. No, I can't see her. Um, and so the... The hypnotist went round the back of the daughter and put his hand in the small of her back and said, I'm holding something, Tom. What am I holding? And he looked at it, thinking, what are you asking me for? It's obvious. It's a watch. His daughter's between him and the watch. And the hypnotist then said, there's an inscription on the, on the watch. Can you read it? And he, he read it, yeah. His daughter's between him and the inscription. Now, if I said this to a Professor Richard Dawkins or one of these, everything is solid kind of mainstream scientists. This, that's ridiculous, impossible, perfectly explainable. Everything in its base form in this reality is an energetic field. It only becomes what appears to be solid when we decode it into that form. See, if you see how holograms are made uh, in, uh, you know, the kind of ones you buy in the shops, and some of them are very sophisticated these days, and what happens is they... Uh, have a laser. Part of the laser uh, goes virtually directly onto a photographic print. The other part of the laser um, takes in the um, in waveform, as the laser uh, records it, um, the waveform image of the, the subject of the picture. And then those two uh, parts of the laser collide with each other on the photographic print. And when you see them, um, in that form. They're just wavy lines. You know, like, a bit like a fingerprint, funnily enough. Um, and it's very similar to the principle of dropping two pebbles in a pond and then the waves go out and they collide. And at that point, that is a waveform version and depiction and record of where those pebbles dropped, how heavy they were, how fast they fell, and all, the, all, all that. And so you've got on a holographic photographic print a waveform um, depiction of the subject, whether it's a person, whether it's a you know, bowl of fruit or whatever. But it's still just waveform. What is it? Then they fire a laser at this waveform information field and suddenly projected or miraculously, it seems, is a three-dimensional holographic image of what's been photographed. 
And so what we're doing, our reality in its base form is like that waveform print. It's waveform information. And what we're doing um, as we decode reality is playing the part of the laser. And this is why what so, some scientists over the years have said um, they, they, they think that this world as we perceive it only exists when it's observed. You must have heard that. Well, I would change the word observed and I would say this world as we perceive it only exists in this form when we decode it from waveform into this, uh, into this holographic form that we think is the, is the solid world. So what's happening with Tom and his daughter is that she, like everything else in the room, in its base form, is a waveform information field. And if he doesn't decode that field into holographic form, he can't see her in this reality we call the five sense world. And what the hypnotist has done, it, by, by um, the hypnotic uh, suggestion, he has in an effect, in computer terms, put a firewall into Tom's brain so that he does not decode that particular field that we call his daughter. Thus, when he looks at the room, he's decoding all the room, all the fields into holographic form, all the other people at the party, but he's not decoding her because been, he's been firewalled off from doing that. Everyone else in the room has not been through that process so they can see her uh, uh, easily. Um, and even down to speech, every, everything is waveform, which we then decode into, into a form that we... Uh, call speech, we call sight, or whatever. For instance, when I'm speaking to you now, what's passing between you and me is not the words you're hearing. What's passing between you and me is a waveform vibrational information form generated by my vocal cords, which create what? A waveform vibrational information field. Your ears then take that vibrational information, they turn it into electrical information, and it's communicated to the brain, and only when the brain decodes that are you hearing words. And so when you, you're growing up as a youngster, and you are brought up with a certain language, your brain is being programmed to decode those information fields in the form that you, you can decode into what we call, uh, say, the English language. But someone in Italy is going through the similar process, and coming to um, a different decoding uh, system, and we call it the Italian language. Uh, and so everything is waveform that we are decoding. Now, this is the key. Just like the hypnotist with Tom, if you can uh, control and manipulate and program the decoding mechanism, you dictate what the target population decodes into the reality it thinks it's experiencing. And that is what is going on. This is fascinating stuff. Dot Connecting with David Icke continues after this short break. Don't go anywhere. And you're very welcome back. This is David Icke, Dot Connecting. Of course, I'm here with David Icke. David, before the break, you were talking about the nature of reality. Yeah, so if you want to dictate what goes on the screen of a computer, you program the way that computer decodes the information. So you, you're dictating not only what go goes on the screen, you're dictating what doesn't go on the screen as well. And so all this social engineering and all this 
programming. And the education system, of course, is a, just a, an absolute classic programming operation. The media is also programming. In the same way that the hypnotist told Tom what his perception was going to be, you will not see your daughter in the room when you come back to a waking state, so the media and the education system is, and, and, and peer pressure have been through the same system and, and, and are, are, are accepting the same reality. It's dictating the reality that we perceive. That's what it's doing. It's, it's in effect programming our biological computer to see reality in a certain way in the most narrow, narrow terms um, uh, possible. So, um, we therefore have a situation where we are operating in a narrow band of frequency, visible light, and outside of that, we can't see it. And we have talked, um, as a result of interviews you've done since the People's Voice uh, came on air, about extraterrestrial life and all that stuff. Well. What's, um, what the concentration of that focus is upon, especially in, if you like, mainstream UFO research, is on the band of frequency that we can see. It's about entities that you can touch in spaceships flying around uh, it, it, that the five senses can see. Well, the vast majority, all but that tiny, tiny fraction I mentioned earlier of possibility and existence and form and creation is exists outside of that and you know my journey over the years has taken me with enormous synchronicity um, into places and into information and to people that have shown me anyway and I detail this in great detail in the books to a point where I can see that this reality that we experience as the world is actually being manipulated from beyond the realms that we can see. And it's very simply done because, again, we see the, 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 the holographic world and the holographic body, what we, what we perceive as solid. But that is a projection from energetic fields. And one level of these, these energetic fields is known as the auric field the auric field around the body, it's an electromagnetic field. And that the information in that field is dictating the nature of the hologram. So inside that uh, field is information that decides if you're black, white, sky blue, pink, whatever. Uh, whether you, whether you, you, you take this form, whether you're a man, whether you're a woman. Now people will say, well hold on a second, but genetics does that, DNA does that. But the DNA and the genetics that we see are only in the hologram. They too are a holographic projection of informa information fields here. So if you can tinker with the information fields, then the DNA and the genetic structure of the body um, must respond to that because that's just a projection of this information. This is where it's going on. This is what we see. So. If you like, this is the projector at the back of the uh, movie theater. That, the holographic world that we see, is the movie hitting the screen. That's why if you try to change things in the world, um, I mean, imagine, you, you don't like a movie. So you stand, you stand on the stage of the theater, you're screaming at the movie, telling it to change. It ain't got to change, it's a done deal. You've got to go back and change the reel. Then you can change the projection. This is exactly the, the principle I'm talking about. And so whatever affects this information field affects the hologram. And this is where possession takes place. Um, throughout uh, history, known history, this has been an absolutely common theme of entities possessing humans and taking over their thought processes, their mental and emotional state. And of course, when you get possession of a very extreme kind, like the exorcist movie type extreme kind, what happens? The person starts to change shape. It's, they start to distort. Why? Because possession doesn't take place of the hologram. It's just a projection. The possession takes place of the, the base information field. So if you can get control of that, say you're another energetic entity of a completely different uh, 
informational type, therefore, um, form, you can access the um, energetic field of the target person, the, the, one, the one you want to possess. When you make this electromagnetic connection, you can start um, feeding information into this uh, field, which is, starts to influence the mental, emotional, and perception processes of the possessed person. You start to change their personality. This is why when you talk to people who have experienced uh, those that have been possessed and they've watched the process, they, they describe how you see the person's personality start to change. But most um, possession is of the more subtle type where you see personality changes. When you get full-blown possession, where the possessing uh, uh, entity information field Im impacts its information upon the target field, then suddenly it is now starting to impact on the information that is being projected into the hologram. And that's when the hologram starts to change shape. That's when you get shape shifting. Because now instead of, if you like, the human information field projecting as the human hologram, now something that's not human is attaching to this field and that is being projected into the hologram as what we, the observer perceives as a shape shift. So if, you know, people have said to me over the years, listen mate, you can't have a situation where you, you, you change shape from a solid form to another solid form. No, you can't. It's impossible. But there are no so solid forms, so it's not necessary. If, if, I'm, if I'm looking at you now, and I'm uh, decoding your human field, then I see you, your human field. If another field starts to impact upon, upon that, I start then to decode that. And suddenly, in my observational, uh, from my point of observation, you're changing shape. You are, your, you, your one solid you is changing to another solid you, but there is no solid you. All I'm seeing is, um, I'm decoding one form of information, human, now I'm decoding another form of information that's impacting over the human, and suddenly, that guy's just changed shape, he's just, he's just turned into a reptile, he's just turned into this, and just turned into that. It's all in the mind of the perceiver. And it just so happens that throughout history, the constant theme through ancient cultures is of entities taking an energetic form outside of our visual capacity to see them, who are locking in to humans possessing them, they call them parasites, and influencing the way they think and influencing the way they behave. And these um, entities have gone under many and various names, but they are all described in basically the same way. And although these entities are in their base state uh, just energy, they can take form by projecting holographic form. And two of the main forms they take are reptilian, when they take form, and the classic grey alien. Now, what is um, fascinating when you think about that, and you think about all the people who've said they've had these experiences with reptilian entities and, and, and alien, grey alien entities and all that stuff, is that in 1945, um, a sealed glass jar was found at a place called Nag Hammadi, uh, on the Nile, about 77 miles from Luxor in uh, Egypt. And what was inside was a cache of writings, of documents, from a people known as the Gnostics. Now, Gnostic uh, thinkers, who had the Gnostic uh, way of seeing the world, um, has popped up many times through uh, history. And certainly since the creation of the Roman Catholic Church, or the Roman Church as it was before, whenever they popped up, the Roman Church has wanted to destroy them mercilessly. The Gnostics were the Cathars in southern France, which the uh, Roman Church destroyed. Um, it, it ended in a, in a gruesome 
uh, mass murder at a place called Montségur, a castle in southern France in, I think it's 12, 1244. And another major expression of the Gnostics was the great library of Alexandria uh, in Egypt, which was the great depository of ancient knowledge and, and texts of the, the world long before um, the, 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 um, that library was created. And, and it was destroyed by the Roman church. I think it was in about 400 AD. These writings, these Gnostic writings, almost certainly came from those that, that ran the great library of Alexandria. And they are thought to have been put together. They were bound in leather um, in something around 400 AD, but, but went back further to about 100 AD. That's the, that's the, um, the assumption. One-fifth of these writings, remember, they've not been tinkered with like the Bible, which has been out in the open and therefore we can tinker with it and change it. They've been in a sealed jar all this time. One-fifth of these writings were about something they called the Archons. And the Archons were described as <clears throat> energetic beings that possessed human, uh, humans and took over their mental and emotional faculties. That they were parasites that fed off human energy. And that they had this <clears throat> great ability to create illusions, to manipulate people's perception of reality. And in these writings, found in 1945 in a sealed jar, these writings said that when they take form, they take mainly two forms. Reptilian, as we perceive them, and as like grey um, fetuses, unformed babies with dark, unmoving eyes. What am I describing? The same... Uh, entities that people today say they're having experiences of and all, that's, all, the, all the rest of it that goes with it. What's also fascinating is when you read the descriptions of the archons as these Gnostics uh, describe them, you're looking at the same uh, phenomenon all over the ancient world. The jinn not just of the Islamic world, but the pre-Islamic world, which is where the jinn came from. What the Islamic, uh, what Islamic uh, believers call the jinn are the archons. In fact, the um, Gnostic writings said that the archons came from luminous fire. And the um, Islamic belief says that the jinn came from smokeless fire. Then you go to Central America and you you hear the shaman there talk about what they call, some call the flyers. And the flyers are described in exactly the same terms as the archons with the Gnostics and the jinn with Islamic belief. Then, you, you, you'll hear Christian people, they've said it to me, that stuff's rubbish, it's not, it's not in the Bible. Sorry? Demons. The demons of the Bible that possessed people and took them over and, and, and dictated their reality and perception are described in the same terms as the jinn and, and the archons and the flyers, and you find it everywhere. It's a universal, a universal uh, common theme. And it's, it's only if you are prepared to, yes, to, um, research the banking system and, 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 and all these other things that, that I've done and so many others have done, but at the same time, open your mind to other possibilities. And if you, if you research the conspiracy and the manipulation of humanity only, only within this five cents, almost unseeable, tiny frequency range, you're going to see the screen. You're going to see the outcome. You're going to see the symptom. You're never going to find the cause. And if you're trying to find the cause, even within the UFO research arena, and you're looking for for, 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 for non-human entities within this band of frequency that you can see and touch and spaceships, you're not going to find the cause either. Because what's manipulating this reality, what's manipulating the human perception, are entities that in their prime form are just energy. And all these things are described um, in, um, 
in Gnostic writings and all these other uh, forms around the world. And <clears throat> there was a, a man, because uh, one of the things that they do is they feed off human low vibrational energy. They feed off the energy of death, they feed off the energy of suffering, they feed off the energy of frustration, of anger, of depression, all these low vibrational frequencies. So what they've done is create, uh, by manipulating human perception and behavior, they've created a society which is just a massive producer of the very energy that they, they live off. We are nothing more. You know in, in the Matrix where Morpheus holds up a battery and he's talking about the machines that took over and created this illusory world called the Matrix. He said, the machines have turned humans into one of these, a battery. And that's exactly what they've done in symbolic terms. And after I <coughs> excuse me, put this all together and put it out in books, I came across some uh, of the work of a guy called Carlos Castaneda. And he wrote a series of books in the 60s and 70s, and, and I think his last one was in 1991. It's called The Active Side of Infinity. And in that book, basically the, the theme and the information in the books came from a Central American shaman called Don Juan Matos. Um, and this is what Don Juan Matos said in this last book of Carlos Castaneda. And when I read it, I fell off my bloody chair almost, because I thought, my God, this is what I've, I've been saying, and, and I didn't even know this, and, and I don't know even from Adam, you know, and, and, and I've talked to Shaman and other people around the world, and they, they, they confirm this basic theme that I'm talking about. This is what Don Juan Matos said. We have a predator that came from the depth of the cosmos and took over the rule of our lives. Human beings are its prisoner. The predator is our lord and master. It has rendered us docile, helpless, if we want to protest, it suppresses our protest. If we want to act independently, it demands that we don't do so. Indeed, we are held prisoner. They took us over because we are food to them, energy, low vibrational emotional energy. And they squeeze us mercilessly because we are their sustenance. Just as we rear chickens in coops, the predators rear us in human coops, human eros. Therefore, their food is always available to them. Brilliant point this. Think for a moment and tell me how you would explain the contradictions between the intelligence of man the engineer and the stupidity of his systems of belief or the stupidity of his contradictory behavior. Sorcerers believe that the predators have given us our systems of belief, our ideas of good and evil, our social mores. They're the ones who set up our dreams of success or failure. They have given us covetedness, greed, and cowardice. It is the predator who makes us complacent, routinary, and egomanical. In order to keep us obedient and meek and weak, the predators engage themselves in a stupendous maneuver. Stupendous, of course, from the point of view of a fighting strategist, a horrendous maneuver from the point of those who suffer it. They gave us their mind. The predator's mind is baroque, contradictory, morose, filled with the fear of being discovered any minute now. And this is what has happened. We have had our perceptions of reality hijacked and possessed by entities that we don't even know exist because we think if we can't see them, they can't exist. And this has driven society in this um, direction of war, conflict, suffering, hunger, death on a massive scale, more and more control, more and more imposition, more and more suppression. Because through that possession of human perception, they're taking the world over and they are changing it, already have to a very large extent, changed it into the form that most suits them and most suits the structure that they can most easily control. And if we do not take this into account when we're trying to understand what's driving this century after century suppression and, and uh, control system, we'll never understand what we're doing and what's actually happening. This is Dot Connecting with David Icke. It's fascinating stuff. And I know you'll be back for the final part in two minutes' time. See you then. And you're very welcome back to the final part of Dot Connecting with David Icke. David. 
Another thing I've been talking about, which is very relevant to, to what we're, we're discussing here, are bloodlines. I've been talking about, and other people have talked about, the fact that you can chart the core of this global manipulation century after century after century to a network of interbreeding bloodlines. And there are um, these particular bloodlines that are genetically bred to be hybrid. Hybrid, part human, hybrid, part these entities that I'm talking about. And once again, we see genetics in the holographic form, but what that is, is a different energetic field. And if you're going to um, possess something, it's a, you're going to possess an energetic field. You have to have frequency compatibility with it. Otherwise, you can't do it. It's like two radio stations, as I said earlier, trying to connect. They can't. They're on a different frequency. So first of all, the idea has been, um, collectively, <coughs> to bring the, the, um, the frequency of humanity down to a level that it can be possessed. And you do that by creating situations in the world that make people um, depressed, angry, uh, uh, and um, uh, anxious, worried, uh, in fear, because they're all expressions of fear. And when, when, when we're in those states, what do we say? God, I'm feeling so heavy today. That feeling of heaviness is energetic density. It makes the frequency of your energetic field um, vibrate slower. The, as it vibrates slower, you enter the field of these entities, and there can be possession. When you're in an open-hearted, high-frequency state, they can't do it, because you're no longer there. That's why they don't want humanity in an open-hearted, high-frequency state. That's why all the time the pressure is the opposite. Conflict and all the rest of it that we see. Um, and because they are not of this frequency but wish to manipulate this reality, they somehow have to have a conduit through which they can do it. And these are these bloodlines. And because they are in energetic form, part human and part non-human, part archon, uh, uh, let, let's say, it means that they are of a frequency that is particularly in sympathy with the, the archontic um, frequency, because part of them is that frequency. Therefore, these bloodlines can be possessed more powerfully and more totally than the rest of the population. And that's the idea, because we look at the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and the royal families of the world, and we think they're in power. They're just vehicles for the real power, which is in the unseen. And this is the whole origin of this perception of the divine right to rule. I mean... I'm always asking questions, why? Where did this come from? Where did this start? Where did this idea come from that because you had a certain genetics, that you had a right to rule? And, and, and where did this whole blue blood thing come from? Where you are of a particular genetics, therefore you have a right to power. It came from the ancient, ancient, ancient world. And it came from the fact that they claimed to be different. They claimed to be above humans because they were this hybrid bloodline. This is why... The um, ancient emperors of, uh, of, uh, of China used to claim the right to rule because of their genetic descendants from what they called the serpent gods. And, and, and because one of the main wa ways that these, the, the, these entities take form when they do is, is in a reptilian form, that's why the, the reptile and the snake has been a symbol of royalty all the way through um, uh, human history right to the present day. And so... These entities um, possess very powerfully these particular bloodlines, and these particular bloodlines uh, find themselves in the positions of power, uh, inherited power in terms of royal power. Um, and they are um, manipulating society to suit the possessing entity. If you want a, um, a, a kind of a, a symbolic um, uh, analogy of, of the, the dynamics, you know when you've got a, a scientist in a in a laboratory and they're dealing with something that's very dangerous. They can't directly touch it. Uh, in this case, because of their frequency, they can't directly operate in this reality, at least not for long. 
Um, so the scientist stands outside of a big sealed tank with the dangerous material inside. And he puts his arms through these big, long um, gloves. And he can work inside the tank um, with this material while standing outside of it. If you take the scientist to be these entities operating outside the human frequency range and the gloves to be these bloodlines, that's the dynamic that I'm talking about. Um, and when you, therefore, follow these bloodlines through, they end up in the positions of power, in royal power and more latterly political power and uh, corporate power and banking power. They are operating an agenda which is coming from outside the world that we see to c take over the world that we see. And so when I talked on, in the last program about this spider in the center of the web and then coming out through the secret societies that are close to the spider and then the semi-secret societies and then into mainstream society with governments, departments and, and, and corporations and banks and all, the, all, all that. Um, and I said it's all coming from the spider but the further you go out, the less they know even the existence of the spider, never mind what the game is. The spider is these entities operating in the unseen. And when you look at things like Satanism, when they're doing their rituals to, the, to their gods, their gods are these entities. And uh, Satanists, and I've talked to many, their hierarchy in this world the satanic hierarchy, is dictated by the power of the entities that they allow to possess them. So the hierarchy, if you like, in the archontic world of the unseen, is transferred to become a human hierarchy based on the power and, if you like, elevation of the entities in the unseen that they've allowed to possess them. It's just a direct um, mirror, one of the other. And when... Um, you have these rituals, and they've been described to me many times. Um, they are doing the same rituals that they were doing in Babylon in the ancient world, because the idea of the ritual is to, is to use various techniques, whether it's chanting, whether it's colors, whatever, because everything is a vibration, everything is a frequency. They're building a vibrational field in the uh, satanic rituals to allow an energetic gateway to be opened that these entities can come into this reality and be seen during the ritual. And I've talked to so many Satanists around the world who, who, who've described this process of standing in the ritual and suddenly this entity starts to form in front of you because they've created an energetic environment in which, in, in which, in which that can happen. And when they are, you know, you, the, the ancient um, theme of the uh, sacrifice of people to the gods and the sacrifice of young virgins to the gods. That is sacrificing people to release the energy, the energy of death, the energy of suffering, the energy of terror, which these entities are actually absorbing on, a, on, a, on an energetic level. And that's where sacrifice to the gods comes from. Um, and it's something that is ancient, that has come all the way through the ages. And people have no problem with the fact that that was going on thousands of years ago, even hundreds of years ago, when humans were a bit more primitive. What they don't find easy to accept is some of the most famous people in the world that they're seeing on their televisions every day are performing these rituals today in the same way. The only difference is that way back it was acceptable and they could do it openly. Now it's not acceptable and therefore they do it secretly. But the same things are happening. And it's this interaction with these gods. And the reason that they talked about young virgins is because it was code for children. Because these entities absorbing human energy, there's one energy they want more than anyone else. And that is the energy of children before puberty. When, pe when children go, young people go through puberty, um, we see that as a hormonal change. But the hormonal change in the hologram is merely a reflection of an energetic information change in, in, the, in the, the, the actually base uh, information field. So what is happening at puberty is this information field, this energetic field, is changing. These entities want to absorb that energy before it changes. And that is not only the origin of 
sacrificing young virgins to the gods. It's the reason why this world is awash with paedophilia and why you find in the so-called upper levels of society paedophilia on a ratio that is vastly, vastly, vastly greater than it is in the general population. For this reason, it's not very nice, but we need to understand what's going on. When the paedophile, be it an elite paedophile, um, which the system then protects, of course, um, albeit um, a possessed paedophile in any way, because this is what paedophilia basically, basically is, it's possession. The entities possess these people, and then they, they in, 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 um, uh, inflict or encourage the urge to have sex with children. When the act is going on, the paedophile is a conduit for the child's energy. And the possessing entity is feeding off that child's energy through the paedophile conduit. And that's why paedophilia is so rampant in the world. Why, wh why, why, would it suddenly, why would it be rampant? There has to be a reason for it. And the reason is these possessing entities want that energy more than anything else. And <coughs> this is why phenomenal, staggering, unthinkable numbers of children go missing in the world every year, never to be accounted for again, because that's what's happening. They're feeding off the energy of those children. And, and when famous people that could be identified are involved, well, they don't want the children around to recognize them, do they? Um, so the world can, and, and the conspiracy can only be understood beyond the play out level of it with banking scams and engineered wars and 9-11s when you realize what the spider is that's, that's actually driving it all. And the spider, the entities, have been the common theme through history. Because these people coming in and out, in and out, um, through the uh, centuries where people have said, why would they give their lives to this conspiracy when they knew it would never reach its end while they were alive? Because they were just conduits for that. And when you look at space and time, they're illusions too. Our perception of time is, just, is, is an illusion. There's only one um, time, and that's now. And people say, well, what about the past? Okay, well, where are you when you're thinking about the past? Well, I'm in the now. Well, what about the future? Well, where are you when you're thinking about the future? I'm in the now. The past and the future are just perceptions of mind within the infinite now. So while we've had this perception of going through um, a series of events that we call history, these entities are operating outside of that timeline. And they, you know, when humans were knocking rocks together, these entities were still there in the form they are now, with the knowledge of reality and manipulating reality that they have now. And this is why all those, all those years ago, um, in the ancient world, people were describing entities that people say that they're experiencing now, like reptilian and grey entities, because they've always been here. This human timeline, this human history, is just our perception of reality. And because they're operating outside of it, they, can, they, can, they are the common theme through this so-called historical story, which is the theme that's pushed this human society in the direction it's gone, to the point now and this has been the whole thing all along. When you're knocking rocks together, you can't use that level of awareness and technological knowledge to take the world over. You cannot manipulate humans to take the world over for you, which is what's happening. Um, you have to get them to a point where they are intelligent enough to work with what we would call high technology computers and other technology because the, the centralization of power in the world and the control system that we see today it would be absolutely impossible don't even think about it without these what we perceive as advanced computer systems so humans had to be brought to a point where they could operate and create these computer systems while at the same time they weren't aware enough intelligent enough to do that 
not intelligent enough to suss why they're doing it and the context in which um, it's all going on. And I will just go back to this, Don Juan Matos. Um, explain the contradiction between the intelligence of man the engineer and the stupidity of his systems of belief or the stupidity of his contradictory behavior. What has happened is humanity has been made just intelligent enough to, to enslave itself, but not intelligent enough to realize that that's what it's doing. This is fascinating stuff. Thank you, David. Um, I'm sure you agree. We'll be back again next week with more Dot Connecting with David Icke. For now, though, bye. Thank you.